My name is Robert Hauser, and I'm the Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this public program of the Society. I'm glad you've joined us this evening. The American Philosophical Society is located, as it has been since its earliest days, in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, the real people. We at the APS recognize their continued presence and honor their community and those of other Native peoples, especially through the working partnerships and fellowships of our Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Reflecting the spirit of inquiry of our founder, Benjamin Franklin, the American Philosophical Society is a participatory organization governed by its highly distinguished elected members for its original mission of promoting useful knowledge. The society's mission is supported and advanced by a staff of about 50 individuals committed to the APS idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. We advance our mission with the engagement of leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through election to membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship, particularly in our semi-annual meetings. We serve scholars through an internationally recognized research library, collecting, preserving, and sharing manuscripts, artwork, books, and artifacts of enduring historic value. We support wide ranging research and discovery through grants and fellowships, publications, prizes, and public exhibitions and lectures. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce this evening's program, which will feature a discussion between two good friends, Linda Greenhouse, president of the American Philosophical Society, and David Tatel, reserve judge of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The subject of their sec discussion tonight are the recent history and current developments in the Supreme Court of the United States, much of which is covered in Linda's new book, Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Coney Barrett, and 12 Months that transformed the Supreme Court. Linda Greenhouse is a clinical lecturer in law and senior research scholar in law at the Yale Law School. She covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times from 1978 to 2008, and she continues to write occasionally for the Times opinion pages. She's received several major journalism awards, including the Pulitzer Prize. Her books include a biography of Justice Harry A. Blackman, Becoming Justice Blackman before, uh, before Roe versus Wade, Voices that Shaped the Abortion Debate before the Supreme Court's ruling. That one was with Reva Siegel. The U.S. Supreme Court, a very short introduction. The Burger Court and the Rise of the Ju Judicial Right with Michael Graetz, and a memoir her most recent book, but one very modestly entitled, Just a Journalist, Reflections on the Press, Life, and the Spaces Between. David Tatel will serve as Linda's interlocutor this evening, after which the floor will be open for questions. You may enter your questions in the Q&A function, probably at the bottom of your screen, at any time. Like me, David attended Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Michigan and his uh, Juris Doctor from the University of Chicago Law School. Following law school, he served as an instructor at the University of Michigan Law School and then joined Sidley Austin in Chicago. Since then, he served as founding director of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and director of the Office for Civil Rights of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare during the Carter administration. Returning to private practice in 1979, David joined Hogan and Hartson, where he founded and headed the firm's educational practice until his appointment 
to the D.C. Circuit Court. While on sabbatical from Hogan and Hartson, he spent a year as a lecturer at the Stanford Law School. He was appointed to the D.C. Circuit Appeals Court in 1994 to the seat previously occupied by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. David and Linda, the floor is yours, virtually, of course. Well, thank you, Bob, and good evening, Linda. Um, I have about a half an hour of questions, and we can have a little discussion, and then we'll open it uh, up to questions from the floor. Um, so um, since the subtitle of your book, Linda, is about the transition from Justice Ginsburg to Justice Barrett, I want to start with a question about the newest justice and, uh, and her role on the court. And I want to focus on a case you discuss in your book called Fulton against Philadelphia. This is a case where the court held that the city had violated the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and it terminated a contract with a Catholic services, social services agency that had refused to consider gay couples as foster parents. Um, as you point out in your book, the new justice, Justice Barrett wrote a two page concurrence uh, which you call her quote, most important writing to date. And then you say this, and this is what I wanna ask you about. But for anyone waiting for the newest justice to reveal herself, this was not much more than a glimpse. A fuller picture would have to await. That was almost a year ago, Linda. So what's the fuller picture? Oh, well. Let me just say first, it's such a treat, David, to be in this conversation with you. For anybody who's interested in the Supreme Court, uh, the chance to chat for an hour with David Tatel is a great, <clears throat> is a great treat. So, you know, we still have just a glimpse in the sense that the court has hardly issued any opinions this term so far. I mean, here we are at the last day of February, and I don't think the court has had more than six or eight uh, various opinions, but what, what we have seen, and maybe what you're driving at, we've seen a lot of activity in what's called the shadow docket of the court. That means cases that the court hasn't formally accepted, but they uh, but but they issue opinions and sometimes precedential opinions. And uh, Justice Barrett has been fully on board with this use of the shadow docket. Um, she's made a key difference in a series of cases uh, in the last term, actually, and it's kind of, there's more shadow docket activity this term, uh, where the court had uh, preferred religion over public health, not to, not to be too reductive about, about what they did. Uh, she in no way has separated herself from uh, the other Trump appointed justices or the, the conservative side of the court, which is, uh, as everybody knows, I think, currently in uh, super majority status. And that's what we've got to deal with going forward. Um, I was going to ask you about the shadow docket because you spend quite a bit of time on it. Um, and of course, that's the uh, procedure the court uses uh, to decide cases um, without full briefing and without oral argument. And I've, it's also a procedure that's been around for a long time, but the message in your book is that for the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, is that the court is actually uh, making law during, in the process of deciding cases in the shadow docket. Is that right? Yes, that's what I meant to say. Uh, yeah. say I mean, there's always been a, what, what used to be called just the emergency docket. Uh, you know, things come yes. up. And, and it's many, in the usual order of things, it's many months between the court receiving a case, granting a case, hearing a case, deciding a case, and something's in an emergency posture, they can't wait. Uh, but what's different now is um, real precedential law is emerging. For instance, the court had an argument today in a big environmental case. And throughout the case, uh, both justices and, and the arguing lawyers cited a case from the shadow docket uh, early this past fall, where the court ruled that the Centers for Disease Control 
did not have the authority to impose a COVID-related um, eviction moratorium uh, on, on, on the country. And uh, although that might actually seem to be a sort of obvious outcome once you pose that question, uh, the court kind of dug in to the extent of a federal agency's authority and, and set some markers for how you judge a federal agency's authority. And to my somewhat surprise, that case, had, that, that little order off the shadow docket has, you might say, metastasized into a, a new principle of administrative law. So there's a lot going on. And it's um, a lot of it's beneath the radar. And it's it bears close watching, but it's not easy to watch it very closely because yeah. of the way these cases come up in the middle of the night. <clears throat> well, let me take you, uh, let me ask you about uh, a non shadow doctor uh, docket case. Um, you spend a lot of time in your book about voting rights. Um, and so I want to ask you about something you said in your book that I thought was quite intriguing uh, about the term, the case the court decided on the last day of its term, Brnovich versus uh, the Democratic National Committee, where the court uh, limited a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. And I wanna read these two sentences from your book, Linda, because I think they're quite profound and I'd like you to say some things about them. The difference between the majority and the dissent's understanding of opportunity in the context of voting was deeply revealing. It was not just that the two sides disagreed about the meaning of statutory language. That happens every day, you say. But that even after a profound threat to the very mechanics of democracy that had played out at its doorstep, the court obviously lacked a shared vision of its role in protecting those mechanics. Why don't you say a few things about that? Well, I mean, in a way that was a little bit prophetic because uh, the court has continued its, you might say, war against the Voting Rights Act uh, uh, as recently as two weeks ago when the court, uh, the, the five justices to Chief Justice Roberts' right, and it takes quite a bit to beat his right on voting rights, uh, issued a stay off the shadow docket of a um, of lower court decision, a special three judge federal court that had ordered the state of Alabama to uh, provide a second congressional district out of its seven, uh, which would have a majority of black citizens. Uh, finding that limiting uh, the opportunity of black people in Alabama to elect a representative of their choice in only one district out of seven violated the Voting Rights Act. And the court has agreed to hear the underlying appeal of this next fall. It's um, very portentous because uh, there is a war going on against the Voting Rights Act. You know that more deeply than almost anybody else in the country because you wrote uh, the decision in Shelby County uh, back uh, 15 years, well, 10 years ago, um, upholding uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, a very important provision that required the Southern states and a couple of Northern jurisdictions to get pre-clearance, to get permission before making any voting changes. You found that perfectly constitutional and the court overruled you. And Shelby County uh, cut the heart out of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And we're gonna see that with the provision at issue in the case that I wrote about that you read and which is the same section in this new Alabama case, section two, which is the core part of the act that is invoked against uh, what's known as vote dilution, uh, voting mechanics or <laughs> districting that uh, deprive people of an equal opportunity to cast their ballot yeah. and elect a representative of their choice. It's very, very consequential uh, what, what's going on right. now. So uh, Shelby County was a constitutional case. Um, Brnovich and uh, the Alabama case you mentioned are, are, are statutory cases. Um, what, 
what do you say to people who look at those cases and say, um, look, this is not uh, a difference in vision about uh, the vote, the basic vote. These are just justices who are disagreeing about how to interpret the statute. I would say, look again and look more closely because what's that issue in this Alabama case? Yes, on the surface, it's a statutory case. How do you apply section two? What does section two mean? But Alabama is arguing that if section two means what the three judge court said it meant, which is that at the threshold, you have to decide whether uh, the black community is compact, cohesive, um, uh, you know the other jargon words better than I do. Yeah, right. uh, to to, um, to constitute uh, an electoral district, you are counting and sorting people by race, and that violates the equal protection guarantee of the Fourteenth Amendment. So, um, as you know, back in 1980, uh, in a case called the City of Mobile, the court basically um, decimated Section Two. By, require, by, by interpreting it as requiring um, proof of intentional discrimination, not just a discriminatory result. Congress thought it fixed that uh, by amending Section 2 back in 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, the young John Roberts, 26 years old, working as a special assistant to Attorney General William French Smith in the Reagan administration, argued vigorously that uh, the statute should not be amended to rescue it, uh, the Senate should not pass the House passed amendment and the Senate did the President Reagan should veto it. John Roberts mm -hmm. lost that battle. But I think um, current history may be on his side. And I think the constitutionality of section two is very, very much in play uh, front and center in this new case. Um, well, I have sort of a related question to that. Um, uh, and it relates to you know the growing criticism uh, in many elements of the court being becoming excessively political. It's become politicized. Um, but Justice Breyer has pushed back against that. And I, I want to just uh, read a, a sentence or two from him and ask you what you think. Um, he says, and this is a quote, uh, jurisprudential differences, not political ones, account for most, perhaps almost all of judicial disagreements. The justices, he insists, are not junior varsity politicians. And then he, as evidence for that, he points out that um, the court didn't hear any of the 22, uh, 2020 election cases. It upheld the constitutionality of Obamacare struck down the Trump administration's effort to mess with the census, and it ruled that the Civil, Rights, the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination based on sexual preference. So what, um, what do you, would you say something about Justice Breyer's views about this, please? Yeah, I mean, I have, you know, huge regard for Stephen Breyer, who's a member of the APS appointment. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not either or. I mean, I'm no kind of psychologist, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, there's kind of motivated reasoning is the concept, right? So I, I think these people don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I was appointed by a Republican president. And I'm going to carry water for the Republican Party. They certainly don't think that. Uh, but they were all chosen for reasons, reasons on... Um, based on the, their, their records and what was known about them. And so, uh, you know, the hard, I think the, the, the hard wiring on the court, the polarization on the court uh, isn't due to partisan politics per se, but it's due to, um, it, it, it's the result of uh, very deliberate you might say right now, the last few years, packing of the court, uh, you know, the, the stolen seat that went to Neil Gorsuch instead of Merrick Garland, and the, uh, the last minute confirmation of Amy Barrett, while 10 million Americans had already cast their 
ballots for president in the early voting. That was just astonishing. And so uh, we've got a court that's hardwired to uh, make the kind of decisions that it's recently made and it's on the verge of making. And so, uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to say that Stephen Breyer is totally right or totally wrong, but but um, but I think we've got our hands full and it's going to be very hard for the average American to look at the court and not see um, raw politics in the cases that are about to come down. Uh, well, I suppose uh, Justice Breyer is not here to defend himself. I suppose he would say something like, yes, uh, the members of the court, uh, the justices of the court, it's true of my court too, have very different uh, political and ideological views and that those views shape the way they think about statutory language and the constitution, but that those disputes are, I, I assume he would say, uh, legitimate questions about how to interpret the language of the constitution. Yes, of course they're shaped by one's ideology, but that doesn't mean their decisions are political. I think that's what he'd say, right? Well, I would, I would step yeah. back a couple of steps because mm -hmm. Uh, as, as people may know, um, the court is not simply the passive recipient of the questions that the American public brings to it. The court has almost complete authority to shape its own agenda. So the question is, what's the agenda? And the court recently has been reaching out to take cases that don't meet the normal criteria for cases that it takes, that is to say, that don't reflect uh, a conflict among courts at your level of the appeals courts. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, court, the courts use its you know, primary role as let's make sure statutory or constitutional law means the same thing in the you know, seventh circuit as it does in the 11th circuit, they would take that kind of case. That's not really what's happening now. They're mm -hmm. reaching out to take cases without conflicts that are gonna serve their ideological purposes and so uh, you know, that's very problematic. And yeah. I, think, uh, I think we have a right to, maybe an obligation to call the court to account for that kind of behavior. Yeah. Um, well, let me change the subject a little bit and ask you a process question. Um, I know I've begun most of my questions with you make a really interesting point, but there's so many interesting points in this book that uh, I'll start every question that way. And I thought one of the most fascinating things you said in the book, uh, Linda, was about the role of the swing justice. And this is a historical point you make. You, you pointed out that for decades, this was a role that was performed by Justice Powell, and then by Justice O'Connor, and then by Justice Kennedy, followed, and this is a quote from you, as you say briefly by Chief Justice Roberts. Then you say, quote, but in the 2020 term, a swing justice was missing. So, I mean, we all, I think the public knows that. I mean, because we see Chief Justice Roberts siding with the dissenters sometimes. But could you say something, you've observed the court for so long, could you say something about how this affects the court's decision-making? How does it affect the outcome of cases when there is no swing justice going back and forth between the two sides? Well, certainly, uh exaggerates the underlying polarization because when you know when Justice Kennedy in his last decade on the court was the swing justice, anybody framing a case or arguing a case had to pitch it to Justice Kennedy. And uh, you know, he was he was quite a conservative justice and especially in his last couple of years, but uh, but neither side could uh, very comfortably take his vote for granted. So that really shaped the way cases were presented. Now that there's a solid five on the right and, uh, and Chief Justice Roberts is pretty comfortable there too with some exceptions, uh, that dynamic has changed. And so I think we're gonna see um, much more sort of sort of hard, hard headed, hard hitting. I'll give you an example. 
So uh, the court, as people know, recently agreed to decide the Harvard University admissions case. <clears throat> this kind of cobbled up case without a real plaintiff that charges that Harvard University uh, has wired its admission system by race and has is discriminating against Asian American applicants. All right, that's an argument. Uh, it's an argument that lost in the two yeah. lower federal courts. So the plaintiff's <coughs> lawyer, <coughs> excuse me, plaintiff's lawyer, now the petitioner, is so confident that uh, he's got the court in his pocket that he opened his petition for cert. And David, you're going to tell me as a judge what you think of this. He opened it with one line, and the, it was a line in quotes. And it simply said, quote, it is a sordid business, comma, this divvying us up by race, period, unquote. That was the first line in the petition to the court. Right. Do you recognize that line? Yes, we all know where that came from. We all know Correct. where that came from. It came it, from right. a dissenting opinion by right. John Roberts in a yeah. Voting Rights Act case uh, in his first few months as Chief Justice. Now, oh. That's not the way to write a petition to the Supreme Court. Uh -huh. That lawyer, William Consovoy, who did a lot of work for Donald Trump during the election period, knew that he has a court in his hands. And of course, the court granted the case. And I, I just found that kind of um, uh, contumacious, you might say, uh, legal yeah. writing, just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. That's an example of what I'm talking about. Well, I just want to pursue with you because I think it's so interesting this notion about not having a swing justice and what effect it has on a court. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, I don't want to get to this in a little while. There's so many faculty members who are members of APS. They're certainly going to want to know what you think about the Harvard and North Carolina cases. But um, so Bakke, which was a time when there was a clear swing vote, Powell. The Bakke decision is basically Justice Powell, right? I mean, it's a decision of one justice. It, sure, it's a decision of the court, but it's one justice. It's not, it's not the, uh, um, the result of a sort of a deliberative compromise or anything. It's the vo vote of one judge. And we have quite a few of those over history. And now that we don't have a swing justice, uh, we, we don't have that. In fact, some people would say, you know, there wasn't a swing justice during the Warren court either. Um, so what, what fascinates me about you raising this is, is it seems to me this does have a profound influence on how an institution like the Supreme Court functions, but you know, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, getting my head around exactly what that influence is at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I wish I had a, a, a definite answer. You know, I mean, one thing that intrigues me is the sort of uh, irony of John Roberts' trajectory, right? Uh, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president in 2016, John Roberts faced being rendered irrelevant on the court because President Clinton would have filled the vacancy that was held open that year by Mitch McConnell. Uh, she would have filled it with somebody to John Roberts left, which would have made five justices headed by the senior of that group, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so who would need John Roberts? Ironically, of course, the opposite happened. And Donald Trump was elected and he filled the vacancy and the next and the next. And so we've got five justices to Roberts right, rendering him irrelevant in, in a number of important respects. And so, um, you know, what does it mean for the court to have a chief justice who in no way is in, in charge? I mean, he dissented from the stay in the Alabama voting rights case, not I think because he disagrees on the merits. He will agree on the merits when the court gets to that. But I think he, he I'm, I'm presuming, but I think he felt the optics of off the shadow docket, the court swooping in and saying, by the way, 
we're going to let the state of Alabama conduct its May primary and its November general election with congressional district lines that a three judge federal court, including two justices appointed by Don two judges appointed by Donald Trump, has found to violate the rights of black citizens under the Voting Rights Act. John Roberts just wasn't going to go along with that. So, you know, we're seeing something quite different, but but you're right. It, it, the, the swing justice is not a historical artifact. It's an artifact of mm -hmm. our modern times. And of course, my, my law students assume it's always been that way. It hasn't always been that way, but it's certainly always been that way in their lifetime. And we've gotten used to it. And we're not yet used to it not being there. We're, we're figuring out what it means. So, um, yeah, it's a really profound question, I think. So let me ask you this, Linda. Um, the, I want to ask you about the Biden, uh, the uh, President Biden's commission on the Supreme Court. Um, you know, it didn't make any recommendations, but it listed a whole bunch of options, you know, like adding more justices, term limits, restricting the court's power, jurisdiction, things like that. You know, you're one of the country's longest observers of this court. You've just written this really interesting book. What do you think about these recommendations? Well, I think, uh, I mean, one thing interesting about the report, which I've read through several times, um, is that although some of the proposals did not get anything close to endorsement, and in fact, the report says we're profoundly divided, that is to say, expanding the court did not get any kind of consensus. Term limits kind of did. I mean, the, you know, the, the deal was the commission was not going to make a hard and fast recommendation. But as I read what they say about term limits, and they say quite a lot, uh, it's now sort of an establishment position that life tenure is not such a hot idea, and term limits have a lot to recommend them now. Uh, there's a big debate about how that can be accomplished, whether it can be accomplished by some kind of statutory workaround or whether it would require a, con a constitutional amendment. And of course, even if everybody woke up tomorrow and said, okay, now we've got term limits, uh, you know, you're not gonna fire any of the incumbent justices. It'll take a long time for that to make a change in the, in the court. Uh, but I, I, I did find it, you know, interesting that Mm -hmm. That the idea of term limits has has moved almost imperceptibly from you might say off the wall to on the wall, so that's pretty interesting. I have to uh, I have to confess that I'm a big fan of life tenure, but I'm curious to know whether you think any of these things have any possible chance of occurring. Do you think they do? Do, do I think life tenure has has a chance of? of um, no, no, the, any, of the, any of the options, you, you mentioned term limits. I know there's a big debate about can that be done by statute? Does it require a constitutional amendment? I mean, it's hard to see in our political system today how the Congress uh, would, ever, would ever agree to any of this. Do, or, or do you think I'm wrong about that? Well, that's not a partisan issue. You know. I mean, expanding the court is a partisan issue. That's not going to happen, yeah. even though that's the easier thing to do in the sense that the Constitution leaves Congress completely free to do that by legislation. Yeah. Far from clear about, about right. getting rid of life tenure. But getting rid of life tenure um, really has no partisan valence. In fact, the whole idea was really put in play maybe 15 years ago um, by a couple of conservative law professors who were just getting very impatient that the liberals never seemed to leave. So, um, you know, there's no reason it wouldn't happen, but there is a big debate over over how it could constitutionally be accomplished. And of course, mm. the U.S. Constitution is known to be the mm. hardest constitution in the world to amend. That's why we have so few amendments. So, you know, it's it, it, it would be a real challenge. Yeah. So before we open this up to questions, Linda, I want to ask you to take out your crystal ball um, and, um, and I want everyone listening here to know that there isn't anybody I know who has a better crystal ball about the Supreme Court than Linda Greenhouse. When I have a question about where the court's going, she's always my first call. Um, 
So I have, I have three quick questions. Uh, you've already alluded to one, but I wanna ask you about it. We have many faculty members in APS and everyone's deeply curious about what you think will happen with the Harvard and North Carolina cases in the next term. Well, of course, the only reason the court agreed to hear these cases is because they wanna get rid of affirmative action, which has been hanging uh -huh. by a thread and was kept alive only by Justice Kennedy, and of course he's gone. Now, of course, you know, whether Harvard's admission system is properly labeled as affirmative action, I mean, there was a whole lot of fact finding in the two week trial, a uh, whole lot of facts. Um, and I think it's overly simplistic from my understanding of the case to call what goes on at Harvard affirmative action in a classic sense. But um, whatever Harvard's been doing, uh, I think the, the days of affirmative action are numbered in months right now. Uh, Do you think that the court will accomplish this by overruling uh, the Michigan cases in Bakke or will they take up Justice O'Connor's suggestion that, you know, it has a life of 25 years and it hasn't been that long, but, you know, I mean, how will they do this, do you think? Well, the North Carolina case explicitly asked the court to overturn the Michigan case. And um, uh -huh. I think they will. They will. Yeah. Okay, uh, we also have in APS uh, lots of journalists and I suspect people are really interested, particularly since all of the publicity about uh, the Sarah Palin defamation case against the New York Times, about uh, what's the half-life of New York Times v. Sullivan. You mentioned it in your book several times and you point out that several justices and other judges have begun to question uh, New York Times v. Sullivan. Uh, that's the rule, of course, that uh, public officials or public persons suing newspapers have to prove actual malice, a very, very high burden. Um, do you, and the court, I uh, several weeks ago, uh, in a case, asked for uh, people for parties' views about about Sullivan again. What what do you think this is uh, is uh, is on the agenda for the next few sometime in the next few years? What do you think? Well, my sense is. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. What might be on the agenda isn't New York Times against Sullivan itself, the core, which applies to public officials. <clears throat> uh. Rather, I think what makes them uncomfortable is it was the subsequent cases that expanded the actual malice yeah. rule, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, public figures of various kinds. So, uh -huh. uh, you know, Sarah Palin, who ran for was governor of Alaska and ran for vice president, there's no doubt that she's a public official, uh, and she's going to bring some kind of appeal, obviously, uh, to, to the, in, in, the, in that case. But I think um, it's, it's more the it's more the public figure cases that I think are are in their sights at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lastly, um, you know, the, as you pointed out, the term's got a long way to go, and we have a new term next year with the new justice. Um, what what would you what what would you like to say in just a couple of minutes, Linda, about just what's ahead for us beyond the cases we've talked about here? Well, you know, we haven't talked about abortion and we haven't talked about guns, but but by the time this term ends, we only have forty have, minutes. <laughs> have major rulings on uh, on on abortion and on the Second Amendment. So that's this term. Next term is shaping up to be all about race. So we've yeah. got you know the admissions cases. We've got the voting rights case. Uh, the court today just agreed to hear a challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a very problematic statute that gives an absolute privilege uh, to the Indian communities in child adoption over the best interest of the child. I hope I'm not being overly simplistic about it. That's my understanding of the law. Um, so, and, and that opens the door to you know, major questions about, about race. Um, so that's what it's gonna be. And yeah. we're gonna have for the first time, uh, two black justices on the court. It's, it's coming from very different parts of the spectrum. I think it's extremely interesting. That's all I can say, it's gonna be really interesting. <laughs> well, Linda, thank you. Um, uh, 
for your answers and for this discussion. Uh, one of the truly wonderful things about the American Philosophical Society is that we have lots of really, really smart members who always have good questions. And Annie, I know you've been keeping track of them. So why don't you identify the person who asked the question and read a couple of them. Sure, thank you, David. Thank you, Linda. That was a, a fascinating conversation. And we do have a number of questions. Um, a lot of them address the topic of changing or quote, fixing, unquote, the court. So David Mas Maxey has asked for you to offer your opinion on changes, on changes you would suggest for the way that the court is constituted. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of interesting suggestions in the President, Presidential Commission's report. Uh, one of them is um, something that other systems have, which is that before the court can invalidate an act of Congress, uh, it needs a supermajority. So no more of these five to fours. Um, of course, now that we have six to three, that may be kind of yesterday's news. Uh, but uh, there's a good argument that Congress, which has the ability under the constitution to shape within limits, the court's jurisdiction could, could do something like that or could um, just kind of limit the court's jurisdiction to um, intervene in various areas of our public life. And I think that it does kind of interest me, maybe more than uh, structural change, which I don't think is going to take us anywhere. David, what, oh, over to you. I think that question was addressed to both of us. Um, I, you're the one who wrote the book, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 my question to you, uh, I think probably predicted my response, which is, I think these are really interesting things to discuss, but I just don't see, uh, I just don't see how, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I haven't fully developed my own views about them, but I don't see how our, our current uh, system, our current Congress, uh, will uh, is capable of addressing these profoundly important questions in a non-ideological way. Uh, I just uh, the Congress is, has become so dysfunctional uh, and so partisan that it it scares me, frankly, uh, the thought that uh, that that this Congress in its current form would be uh, thinking deeply about what to do with our Supreme Court. And that worries me a lot. I think that's a very, very fair response. Yeah. Again, as a as a follow up from from several of our guests, uh, does that mean that the Biden's uh, study commission um, is not going to go anywhere? Well, I think that's um, a little too much of a short timeline. You know, there's a sense in which the commission of you know, 34 very serious people who took, I, I know a number of them and they took this job very seriously. Um, we're writing not for next week uh, or even next year, but in, in rehearsing you know, all the pro and con arguments about all the proposals, um, you know, set down markers for how to think about these things for the, for the future. So um, I think it was quite a worthwhile exercise even though, as David said, I mean, there's no way the current Congress, probably, probably for better, not for worse, is um, is, is going to pick up on any of it. But um, you know, people who are interested, it, it's the whole thing is online. If you're going to read it, <clears throat> uh, don't skip the testimony that was uh, put to the put to the commission, which is fascinating. Um, I have a piece about it coming out in. Uh, soon to be coming out of the New York Review of Books where I undertook to review the commission's report as, as a book. Um, so you can see more what I what I think in that in that piece when it appears. Our next question is from um, Rob Cattell and it's um, a complete 
uh, change of topic here. It says, could the Supreme Court disqualify a constitutional amendment? There is a group trying to pass a constitutional amendment that will allow Congress to regulate political contributions. If their efforts are successful, could the court overturn it? No. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> The answer was briefer than my uh, um, my uh, my scrolling here, <laughs> right. um, David. Uh, we have a question from Joanne Barkan, and she would like you to elaborate on your defense of life terms for justices. I'm not um, sure full defense. <laughs> pardon me. I, I I'm not sure, David, um, that you offered a full defense of life tenure. Um, I, I am a big believer in life, the life tenure judiciary. I, I, uh, now, of course, I've spent my career on a circuit court, not the Supreme Court, but I think, as I think about the uh, um, historical value of our judicial system and how effective it's been over our history, I think the life tenure um, uh, was one of the most important things the framers of the Constitution uh, did. Um, now, that doesn't mean our courts are perfect. And I do think that term limits, at least at the Supreme Court level, might make some sense. But life tenure uh, provides a level of independence that I think is invaluable and, and essential for a, a judicial system in a, in a system based on the rule of law. I, I wouldn't give it up. Uh, we have a question from Jim um, Catalyst. Should Justice Thomas recuse himself from cases in which his wife has been either formally or informally involved? Sorry, what was the question? Was that a question or a statement? That was, that was a, a question. Should Judge Thomas recuse himself from cases that his wife has either been formally or informally involved? Uh, probably so, yes. Um, uh, a gentleman named uh, Nielsen has a question. Uh, what is the constitutional question? Is there one underlying the case about EPA authority to limit power plant emissions? That's a purely statutory case. And it has to do with uh, how the court goes about um, uh, defining an agency's uh, authority under its governing statute. So I, I don't believe there's any constitutional issue in that case. I would just add to that. You know, I think, you know, the way the case comes up, I think is absolutely right. About that. But I, I do think uh, that at least um, the judges and, uh, and um, others who are concerned about administrative agencies. Um, I, I think they 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 see a serious a separation of powers uh, question involved in 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 this in terms of um, how much independence a federal agency should really have. Um, so there is there is a constitutional issue lurking here, whether it's. Whether it's going to be, I mean, I think Linda is absolutely right about the case the court heard today. It's totally cast in terms of, uh, of of interpreting the Clean Air Act, but 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 I do think there's a constitutional issue lurking here for many people. David Shipler asks: Is there a risk that as the court goes further and further towards the edge of public sentiment, that its decisions will be ignored? For example, there are many surreptitious ways for colleges to evade a ruling that bars race from being considered at all in admissions. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, certainly uh, if the court overturns the Michigan case in university admissions, um, I find it hard to imagine that that will mean that um, universities that care to take account of race will suddenly shut their eyes to it or that you know that Harvard University would go completely on you know test scores or something um, 
you know, there'd be there'd be seemingly race neutral or, or I should say facially race neutral workarounds. And that was, for instance, um, what the University of Texas came up with in response to, it wasn't actually a Supreme Court decision at that time, it was a decision by federal appeals court uh, barring affirmative action at, at UT Austin. And so um, Texas devised this top 10% plan on uh, top 10% of every high school in the state, uh, students would be uh, admitted to the flagship university. And of course, the public schools in Texas, like everywhere else, um, are, are highly racially segregated. So that guaranteed a constant flow of non-white uh, students in, in, into UT. And so, you know, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, would raise other questions, obviously. Um, it would be quite a quite a time of turmoil, but um, but I'm here to say that universities that are committed to some kind of diversity in their entering class are not just going to roll over for um, for a decision from the court uh, in, on, on this question. And we have time for one last question and it's from an anonymous attendee. The dialogue so far has been mostly about recent decisions, cases and justice appointments. I'm curious, Professor Greenhouse, about your use of the phrase justice on the brink. I would like to hear more of your thoughts on what are we on the brink of? Okay, so, you know, it's kind of a deliberately ambiguous title because obviously for uh, people who are you know, cheering the rise of the judicial right. Uh, you could say that in the term I write about, the 2020-21 term, we're finally on the brink of achieving what that side of the street has tried since the Reagan years, uh, never quite made it to, to achieve. Uh, from a progressive point of view, which obviously I personally embrace, um, we're on the brink of that very thing. We're on the brink of um, uh, an empowered, emboldened, conservative majority on the court in pursuit of an agenda to um, take us back and reinterpret uh, the Constitution in ways that would uh, Strip us of a reproductive autonomy, to name one, would uh, privilege religion claims over all other claims in the public sphere, and so on and so on. So, uh, you know, what we're on the brink of, um, we, we, we can agree, I think, uh, we're on the brink of something uh, very, very major, and whether we cheer it or fear it is, uh, depends on where we're coming from. Linda, David, thank you again for a fascinating conversation. Um, I'm sure Linda's book is available at, at many locations and through, through Amazon. And, um, and I know you're all going to run right out and, and purchase it to, uh, to continue this, uh, this good uh, conversation. Um, and we wish you all well. And we'll see you again soon for our next public lecture. Thank you. And I just thank David, who doesn't have a book to sell and was just really nice to be willing to do this. I, thank you very much. Linda, the, uh, it was my pleasure.